and I guess the kids can go back for, well, they're already going back. They're, they're, they're gone. They're done. All right, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, when I was, I didn't get too much Sunday schooling when I was young, but I did, I did go a few times and had a, had a little bit, and I enjoyed it. They love it. It was a lot of fun, you know. Sometimes you just, you know, don't want to be with the adults. You want to be with people your own age. So. I think they lost my sword. Right behind you. Stop. Oh, right there. There you go, sir. Yeah, don't be without your sword now. No, double edged sword. That wouldn't be right. Double edged sword. Cut you coming and going. <laughs> yes, it does. And speaking of that, we're going to jump into our sermon this morning about who is this Jesus? And I think it's important that we, we take a time to stop and reflect about who Jesus really is. I think it, if you've been in the church a while, we can become really complacent with Jesus. We can say, well, you know, I know who Jesus is. Let me go to lunch. I'm done. I'm out. Right? But the problem is, is that sometimes we can get so complacent that Jesus isn't taking the correct place in our lives like He's supposed to. And we have to be really careful with that. Is, is, is somebody doing this? Oh, that's on. Okay, perfect. Thank you. It's um, uh, so, we, we, and we don't want to get complacent about Jesus because what we're going to find out today is, is that he's, he's the center of everything. And in order for us to do that, understand that sometimes we need a reminder. So the... The title today is "Who is this Jesus?" and we're gonna we're gonna look at some. Let's see what. Yeah, turn it on. Inside. On this. Inside. You need some lessons for. Here I do. I do. <laughs> see. See, Pastor Rick's not gonna let me do this anymore. <laughs> I don't know. Either. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So we start out, and Jesus asks his disciples a very interesting question. He says. So Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. And there was a great misunderstanding about who Jesus really is and was. But then Jesus asks a very important question, and I like to think about this as being asked not just to Peter, who will answer the question, and the disciples, but to our very selves. And that is, but what about you? Who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. <clears throat> and it's very important that we understand that this question is really where the rubber meets the road. Because if you don't understand who Jesus is, and Jesus isn't who He says He is to you, He doesn't have the place in your life that He needs to hold. And Jesus had some very interesting things to say throughout the Bible. One of the things He said was, Many shall come in that day and say, Lord, Lord. These people were calling Him Lord. Did we not do X, Y, and Z? And I'm paraphrasing here. But they were doing kingdom work. They thought they knew who he was. They thought they had the correct answer to this question. And they were doing works that were seemingly the right answer to the question. But then Jesus comes to this place and he says, I'm going to tell those people, depart from me. I never knew you. And those are words you never want to hear. You never want to hear those words. And you have to ask ourselves, if those people could call Him Lord, and let's be honest, we don't call everybody Lord. Lord's one of those terms. So they thought they knew who He was. And they thought they were doing the work that was required to go into the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus tells them specifically, I don't know you. Now Jesus is the Lord. And you know on a certain level that He knows everybody. So I don't think he was meaning particularly that he didn't know who they were as much as he was saying, you don't know who I am. And that really is the crux of the problem. So today we're going to look at some things. 
There were many misconceptions about Jesus. Some thought he was just a good teacher. I mean, the first thing that we really read after Jesus' birth and his travel down into Egypt and coming back out of Egypt is he's in the temple. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees are asking him questions. And he's giving them answers that are just blowing their mind. So there were people who thought, hey, he, he's a great teacher. He knows something about God. But certainly the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they failed to recognize who he really was. So they thought he was a good teacher, but that's not enough. And some people thought he was a prophet. Remember when he called Nathaniel? Nathaniel was sitting up in a tree, as I remember right. And Jesus tells him, I, I saw you when you were sitting up in the tree before you ever came. And he's like, oh, you're a prophet. Well, yeah, Jesus is a prophet. But if that's all you think he is, you're wrong. <laughs> and what about the people who he healed? Touched their ear and healed their ear or touched their eyes and gave them sight. He certainly was a healer. But if that's all you know about Jesus, you don't really know the whole Jesus. And even the disciples thought that he was a person who was going to overthrow Rome. Because his disciples asked him, Jesus, are you now going to return you know, the glory to the nation of Israel that they had? Are you going to return the kingdom to them? Are you going to take this yoke of bondage that, that we're under as, as, as slaves to the Romans? Are, are you going to take that away from us now? And Jesus had a, a greater mission to fulfill than all of these things. And again, the Pharisees and the Sadducees failed to really recognize who Jesus was. And even his own disciples, they were confused about his true identity. They're on the, I'm reminded of when they were on the lake, remember? They were, they were in the boat, and then the storm came up and Jesus was asleep in the boat. And they had to go and wake him up. He was really tired. As he must be tired of us sometimes. <laughs> I think about that. I think, you know, the Lord really must be tired sometimes. But praise God, they, they, they woke him up and they said, Master, don't you care that we're going to die? We're, we're going to die. We're, we're, this boat's going to be swamped. We're going out to the bottom of this lake. And you're busy sleeping. But they failed to recognize who he was. Because what happens later is that he speaks to the waves and he speaks to the wind and he says peace be still and what happens it stops and then in their hearts some of them are even more afraid than ever because now they're not afraid of going to the bottom of the sea of galilee they're afraid of who is this jesus who is this who speaks to the wind and it says stop and it just boop, stops have you ever gone out on a windy day and it, everything's blowing everywhere and you're like, wow, just stop? Yes. I, I bet it didn't. <laughs> I just bet it didn't. But even his, his own disciples were confused. And part of that confusion, we're going to see later on, is because the Holy Spirit hadn't come upon people to stay at that point. In the Old Testament, we see the Holy Spirit coming upon people for certain tasks. And even David, in, in the 50, I think it's the 51st Psalm, he talks about that, you know, that famous, you know, create in me a clean heart and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Because see, when he sinned with Bathsheba and then he had her husband sent to the front lines to be killed and then he lied to the high priest about all of that, do you think the Holy Spirit was on him at that moment? He wasn't. Holy Spirit had departed from him, and he felt that, right? And he wanted it back. So the the disciples initially didn't have that that whole thing of having the Holy Spirit on them all the time. That wouldn't come until later in the second chapter of Acts, where we read about the day of Pentecost and that mighty rushing wind that Gene was singing about earlier. So many are confused about Jesus and his purpose. Some say he's a philosopher. Some say he's a great teacher. Some people think he's a genie to grant their wishes. One of the many ways to get to heaven. You ever, how many of you have ever listened to Oprah Winfrey? 
She'll be first to tell you, don't get your theology from Oprah Winfrey, by the way. This is where you need to get your theology, just in case you were, you were curious. But so many people, herself included, think that Jesus is one of many ways to get to heaven. Right? People want a Savior, but they don't really want a Lord. And what we're going to, what if you hang around me any amount of time, you'll hear me say this. If you don't want Jesus to be your Lord, He doesn't want to be your Savior either. He has no intentions of being your Savior only. He is your Savior and your Lord, or He is nothing to you. But there's a lot of opinions, and opinions about His true identity vary widely. And you know what they say about opinions? Buzz Lightyear and Woody here, he says, you see, people don't want to hear your opinion. They want to hear their opinion coming out of your mouth. And isn't that true? Right? People don't really care. They might ask you what you think, but they don't really care what you think. They, they want to hear their opinion coming out of your mouth. And isn't that, isn't that just the way we are today? People want to hear about the goodies of Jesus, but they don't want to hear, they are like... Oh yeah, I want to go to heaven. Because, I mean, let's be honest. Have you met anybody yet that says, yeah, I really want to go to hell for eternity. Yeah, that's, that's good with me. Have you met that person yet? Because I haven't. Everybody wants to go to heaven. But the problem is, is that when you ask people, okay, are you willing for Jesus to not only be your Savior, but to be your Lord and Master of your life? And your thoughts are his thoughts. Your actions become, or his actions become your actions. That you don't have a right to yourself anymore. That you're, he's your Lord and you, you do what he says for you to do. And Jesus said this himself. He said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. It's not an option. It's not like, well, I, I just want the good part. I just want the, I just want to go to heaven part. No, no, you don't, you don't get to have that. If you want that, you've got to have the part that says that he's Lord. And that your opinion doesn't matter as much as his. <clears throat> so it's extremely important that we know, follow, and worship the real Jesus. So starting in John 14, 26, it tells us how we can be sure that we're following the right Jesus. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. You see, sometimes we we got people that want to give all the glory to God the Father, or they want to give all the glory to Jesus the Son, or they want to give all the Spirit, you know, they want to pay attention to just the Holy Spirit. But you see, we have a triune God. We have a God that's three in one. And the purpose of Jesus was to come and sacrifice his life for us. That we might have a righteousness, not of our own, but from him. That's what he does. But the Holy Spirit, he is the one that teaches you all things. In another place the Bible talks about who knows the mind of God except the Spirit of God. So it's the Holy Spirit who teaches us all things and reminds you of everything that Jesus has said. And not only reminds you of what He said, but shows you what it really means. Because let's face it, if I read this book and I have an interpretation of my own, what good is that? That's no good. That doesn't do anybody any good. Again, that goes back to what I think. And unfortunately, nobody cares what Foster thinks. But the Holy Spirit reveals Jesus to us. And that's why, that's His place. That's His job. That's what He does best. He brings glory to the Son. Amen. He shows us what this Scripture really means. This is a love letter from God to us. But, you, but it's foolishness until the Holy Spirit reveals it to you. Matter of fact, Jesus Christ is foolishness until the Holy Spirit reveals Him to you. 
Yes, it's important for us to have faith. But where does that faith come from? That faith comes by God the Father sending the Holy Spirit to open our eyes that we might see who Jesus really is and have faith in Him. It's a gift of God, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It's not of ourselves, lest any man should boast. It's a gift from God. And the Holy Spirit is the one who brings that to us. And the primary tool that the Holy Spirit uses is the Scriptures. In John 5.39, it says, you, Jesus says, You study the Scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. He was talking to the Pharisees here. But he said, These are the very Scriptures that testify about me. You see, the Pharisees had come to this place where they thought, Look, man, you know what? We're Israelites. We're God's chosen people. You needn't tell us, Jesus, about anything. Because we're, we're His chosen people. We've got the books of Moses. We've got the Old Testament. We've we, we, we got the line here. We know exactly what's going on. And Jesus says, No, you don't. No, you don't. You think that you have eternal life. And you seek diligently for it. But the problem is, is that I'm the life. We're going to find out about that. But these are the very scriptures that testify about Jesus. And we're going to see very clearly before the end of today that, that Jesus is spoken about all over. Not just in the New Testament, but he's all over the Old as well. That everything is about Jesus. <clears throat> so what better way to learn about Jesus than what he says about himself? Right? I mean, you can read about somebody online... But how much better would it be to sit down and talk to that person? If you could sit down and talk to George Washington and find out, hey, you wrote this, what did you really mean by that? Who would know that better than George Washington himself, right? But here we have something even more important. We've got Jesus speaking about himself. And he makes seven incredible statements about himself. There's actually an eighth one in Revelation where he talks about himself. But for today, we're going to look at these seven I am statements that Jesus makes. We start our journey in John 6, verses 48 through 51. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. That manna that the people, that the Israelites ate in the wilderness, that was a provision that God made for them. But it was a physical provision, wasn't it? Right? They were in the desert. They couldn't grow crops. They had, you know, only what little cattle they had with them. They're wandering around the desert. They needed something to eat. And they needed something that would be fresh. That would be fresh each day. So God provided this manna from heaven, which is a type of the living bread that was to come. The Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I am the bread of life. And we celebrate that in this church. I love how this church does communion every Sunday. Because I think we need to be reminded of Jesus' sacrifice. We need to understand that it's His life. He's that bread that we're eating. And He broke the bread and He gave it to the disciples. He said, this is my body broken for you. He is the bread of life. And He did on the cross give His life for the world. Jesus is our sustainer of all things, physical and spiritual. We have houses and we have jobs and food, church, heaven, cars. What I want everybody to understand is, is that Jesus doesn't just make a way for you to go to heaven. Jesus provides all of that too. That's all Him. Everything. Everything you own came from Him. And somebody might say, well, look, I, look Foster, I, I have a job. I, I go to work. I, I, I earn my stuff. Okay. But who gave you breath 
that you might live, that you might go to work? Who gave you feet that work that you might go? Who gave you a car that you might get to your job? Jesus. He, he gives you everything. And my question to you, and is to me as well, it's convicting. How often do we really think of that? When you walk into your house this afternoon and lay down and take a nap or whatever you do, do you say, thank you God for this house? Because he gave it to you. When you get out of church and you go and you get in your car, God gave you that too. And we're just stewards. We don't even really get to keep it, do we? I mean, you don't, do you still have the first car, Rick, that you, that you ever bought? Nope. I don't have the first car that I've got. It's a junkyard somewhere rotting away, I suppose. Right? We buy food, we eat it, our body uses it, and then it's gone. We don't, we don't get to hold on to it. Homes, you know, we have our homes, and we hold on to them longer, hopefully, than a car or food. But they're not ours forever. Eventually, somebody had that house before you, or even if you built the house, somebody will have it when you're gone. <laughs> but Jesus is the sustainer of all of our things, both physical and spiritual. And I, I, I ask that you that you remind yourself of that. I know lately with this COVID thing, I, I've been very grateful to just have a job. Just just be able to go to work. Because there's 48 million Americans who don't have one anymore. And you know eventually you can't have the government just provide for you forever. It doesn't really work like that in America. So we need to be grateful for all the things that Jesus provides for us. Going on to the second one, in John 8, 12, Jesus says, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus brings light to the world. Everything is exposed to this powerful light. Nothing is ever hidden. See, there's things that you can hide from me. And you might even be able to hide them from your family or whatever. But you can't hide them from Jesus. He knows. Every thought we've had, everything that we've ever done, He knows. He is the light. And not only does Jesus bring light to our lives, He exposes all the traps of the evil one. He says that we can walk in the light as He is in the light. And don't we know that when we're walking in the light with Jesus that things are really okay? I mean, if we're real honest with ourselves, when we get into trouble, isn't it because we kind of lag back into that shadowy, dark area and we stumble and fall? And then we're like, oh, run, 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 up to Jesus. And really, what it really boils down to is repenting of our sin. And we don't even have to run very far because Jesus is right there. Right? Mm -hmm. But if we walk in that light, all we need to do is follow after Him. And finally, as He's talking about the light, in heaven, He will be our, our physical light. Because the Bible tells us that the sun that we have that shines in the sky, that we can't even look into without sunglasses... <laughs> like, 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 like my brother here uh, <laughs> we, that sun would be too dim in heaven it would be too dim Jesus will be our physical light he is the light of the world and by the light of his Holy Spirit we understand more and more about who he is and more and more about who he requires us to be in the things that He requires us to do. In John 10, verses 7 through 9, Jesus identifies Himself as the gate. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved, and they will come in and go out and find pasture. And I love this picture because, um, does this have a pointer on it? Yep, the big circle in the middle. Oh, okay. 
these these were the sheep pens that they had, and they were they were very uh, small. I mean, you know, not very not very tall uh, stone walls, and the gate was just an opening where the sheep could come in and and rest for the night, and fit and physically the shepherd would do exactly what this what we see the shepherd here doing lay across that gate and that way the sheep would know that they were safe and protected they would stay inside there they wouldn't go over the top of him but he could go to sleep right there and know that if a wolf came that the sheep were protected because nothing could get in all that come in any other way are thieves and robbers but the sheep have not have not listened to them I am the gate and this is also another key critical element when we look at salvation that there is no other way to be saved except through Jesus Christ. Jesus will later on tell us that he is the only way. Not just a way, but the only way. But I love this picture because it shows exactly what the shepherds would do. That that's how they would protect their sheep and be able to take a nap. Jesus is the only way in and the only way out. The sheep are protected from any would-be intruders and are even protected from straying outside the pen. I read a book once. I, uh, I think somebody loaned it to me. but It's about um, the 23rd Psalm and the Good Shepherd. And it talks all about, and it was written by a, a guy who was actually pastor, you know, had sheep. So he knew exactly what he was talking about, but he goes through and he explains line by line how important that is. But sheep are not the smartest animals in the world. They, they stray off pretty easy. And they get themselves in a lot of trouble. And that's why Jesus calls us sheep. Because we're kind of like sheep. We kind of stray off pretty easy. We kind of want to go our own way. And we need to be led by still waters. We need to be protected from wandering off. In John 10, 11 through 18, Jesus tells us that he is the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and he runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and he doesn't care about the sheep. But I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I want to stop right there because I want to tell you something. When the shepherds would get together, they would get together and all their sheep would be intermingled together in one big pasture sometimes. There would be five or six of them or how many ever, and then all the sheep would be together. Now when the shepherd was ready to take his flock out, he called them. And this is very important that we understand this. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. They listen to me. They know my voice. Jesus calls us one by one. And when we hear his voice, we follow him. And that's a beautiful picture there that I, I didn't, wasn't aware of until I, I, I didn't realize that how they would, if they put all the sheep together, how they would separate them back out. But the sheep know the shepherd's voice. They know their shepherd. They wouldn't listen to somebody else. They wouldn't follow them. They would only follow their shepherd. So when Jesus says he knows you, you can take that to the bank. He knows you. And we need to learn to listen to his voice. And we, by the holy the power of the Holy Spirit, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. How well is that? Well, think about Jesus and God the Father and the Holy Spirit in eternity. Before there was ever anything made, the three of them were together. 
So how well do you think Jesus knows his father? And yet he says that he knows his sheep as well as his father knows him and he knows the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this pen. There he's talking about the difference between the Jews and the Gentiles. Right? Because you, you'll read as you go through the Gospels and other places you find that Jesus tried to preach to the Jews. He tried to go to them first. But they didn't want to hear him. They didn't want to listen to him. And that's when he began to go to the other sheep, which is the Gentiles, that are not of this pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice. And there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Don't you know that Paul talks about a tree and how the, the, the wild olive tree gets grafted into the natural tree and the two become one? Here's Jesus talking about that same thing. There is no separation between Israel and the Gentiles because we've become one. He says, they too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. That's interesting right there. Only to take it up again. What happened three days after they put him in that tomb? He took it up again. See, you can't... We're going to get to a, a point here where we're going to talk more about Jesus being the life. But see, the Romans only thought they took his life. You, you can't take the life of God. Only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Right? It wasn't the Romans that held him to the cross. It wasn't even the nails that held him to the cross. You know what held him to the cross? His desire to save you and me. That's what held him. Our sin. That's what held him to the cross. Right? But no one takes it, his life from him, but he lays it down of his own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. And don't, and don't we see that in the cross? Don't we see that when He had done what He had come to do, that He laid down His life, He allowed Himself to die on that cross. And in that moment, He cries out and says, My Father, or my God, why hast Thou forsaken Me? In that moment, even the Father can't look on the Son because of the sin that Jesus is bearing. That sin was not His own, that sin was ours. It was our sin that took him to the cross. And he laid down his life willingly for us, his sheep. And three days later, he picked it back up again. He was done doing what he needed to do. Jesus lovingly guides and cares for his sheep. Notice that he provides everything they need. The food, the water, the, the protection, everything. He lays down his very life for the sheep. And no one can take it from him. Praise God. If that doesn't, if that, if you, if you don't feel something in your heart for Jesus, knowing that this is what He does for you, well, I'd have to question that. In John 11, 17 through 27, Jesus states that He is the resurrection and the life. On His arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. Not he was just resurrected or he has the power to resurrect Lazarus, but he is the resurrection and the life. All of it. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me, they will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. 
And I ask you, do you believe this? He is the resurrection and the life. Jesus isn't just alive. He is life itself. He is life. Giving life as he sees fit. Everything that has life has received life from him. Why did God the Father lay down in the Ten Commandments and say, Thou shalt not kill? Because life is precious. Where did we get it? From His Son. From Jesus. All life comes from Jesus. He's not a life. He is the life. In John 14, 1-7, Jesus says He is the way, the life, and the truth. It says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? I want to just stop right there for a second. Do you understand that not only did Jesus die on the cross for you, but he's gone to heaven to prepare a place for you? That should blow your mind. That blows my mind. I listened to a, a, a gospel, or an early gospel artist by the name of Keith Green. He's long gone to be with the Lord. But he says, you know, he says, um, well, he had several sayings, but he said, you know, if God made everything that is in seven days, and he's been working on this place in heaven for 2,000 years, then living down here must be like giving, living in a garbage can compared to what's going on up there. But Jesus has gone to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You see, Jesus doesn't just love you enough to die for you, to, to give you to heaven. He, he wants you to be where he is. You know the way to the place where I am going. And Thomas said, Lord... We don't know where you're going. So, so how can we know the way? This is an excellent question. And another example of the fact that even though these men had been with him, they'd seen the miracles, they'd seen all the things, they'd been right with him. They still didn't quite get it yet. And that's why we need the Holy Spirit just like they need, needed the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit reveals all these things. They did know the way where he was going, but they didn't know that they knew the way. But come Pentecost, mm -hmm. they would know the way. And we see that in Peter. We see that he's now not this impetuous guy making all these mistakes. We see him be the rock. Right? There's no more waffling in Peter after Pentecost. Not the guy stepping out of the boat and falling into the water. Not the guy, you know making the mistakes, denying the Lord. None of that. No more of that nonsense. Not after Pentecost. He becomes the rock. But he does that because of the power of the Holy Spirit being with him all the time. So Jesus answered and says, I am the way and the truth and the life. And this is so important. I mean, if I, if I could only have one I mean, I don't know what I would do without all the rest of the, go the gospel, but, but that verse is so important, John 14, 6. Amen. It's one that you should know. You should memorize it. Because Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He tells you right here. He's the way. Follow me. I am the way. People say all the time, what's the purpose of my life? Why am I here? To figure out who he is and follow him. That's why you're here. That's your purpose in life. It is. To know Jesus Christ and to follow him. He is the way. And the truth. Pilate would ask him very famously, what is truth? Wasn't that ironic? You want to talk about irony. There it is right there. Pilate looking at Jesus saying, what is truth? Um, you're looking at the truth. <laughs> you're looking at him. He is the truth. Whatever he says, whatever he does... His word, he is the truth. You want to know what the truth is? There you go. There it is. He is the truth. 
And again, he's the life. He is life. Jesus said, I came that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. What is that? Are all the people in this room as Christians, are all of you rich beyond your wildest dreams? Are all of you healthy beyond your wildest dreams? Do you have everything that you wish, you know, when you snap your fingers, does the house just get clean, Tina? Does that work for you? Okay, alrighty then. So what's Jesus talking about? He's talking about himself. He's the life. And don't we have it ever so much more abundantly? In the midst of our trials and tribulations and everything that we go through, isn't your life better for knowing Jesus Christ? Amen. Amen. Of course it is. No one comes to the Father except through me. Oprah, here you go. There's your verse. <laughs> 14, 6, and 7. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him. And you've seen Him. See, when we look at Jesus Christ, we've seen the Father. He tells that to Philip. He's talking about the Father. And Philip says, Lord Jesus, just show us the Father. Come on now. Just, just show us the Father and that'll be enough for us. And Jesus, and Jesus says to him, Philip, you've been with me so long. Do you not know that when you've seen me, you've seen the Father? For I and the Father are one. There's one way. In spite of what anybody may think, there's one way. There's only one way to heaven, and His name is Jesus. Period. And we got to be honest in our evangelism about that with other people. When they go, oh, well, what about the Buddhists? What about this? What about... I'm sorry. Jesus said He is the way, the life, and the truth, and no one comes unto the Father except through Him. So either Jesus has to be a liar, or you have to be wrong. I'm sorry. It's not my word. It's Jesus' word. But I'll tell you what, as a minister of the gospel, I better be out preaching his word. And this is what he says. He's the only way. I'm sorry. It sounds exclusive. It is exclusive. But Jesus is God. He gets to make the rules, not me. He's the only way to get to heaven. And here is truth. The truth is Jesus. And the only truth that will really set you free is Jesus. I mean, don't we teach our kids to always tell the truth? And then sometimes doesn't the truth backfire on them? And they come in and they look at you and they say, well, Dad, you told me to always tell the truth. Mom, you told me to always tell the truth and everything would be fine. It didn't work out so good. Yeah. Well, there you go. You want the truth that will set you free? There he is. It's Jesus. That truth will set you free. Sometimes in our broken, sin-soaked world, the truth doesn't always set you free. Sometimes it gets you in prison. <laughs> Sometimes it gets you in a whole lot of trouble. But Jesus is the truth that will set you free. Jesus says in John 15, 1 through 5, that he is the vine. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Oh boy, that should get you. That should get you right there. Because that's not me telling you to go out and bear fruit. That's Jesus telling you that his father's the gardener and that he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. I know it's not about works. I know the righteousness comes from Christ. But based on us knowing who he is, there needs to be some fruit. It might be tiny little fruit, but there should be some fruit. And don't, don't get mad at me. Foster didn't tell you there needed to be fruit. Jesus told you there needed to be fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even, what? More fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me. There you go. There's, the, there's another one of those verses. Remain in me. See, we have to remain in Jesus. I can't just get a dose of Jesus in the morning and then just walk out the door and then I'm done with Jesus and I got this all by myself. It doesn't work like that. I have to remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. See, my efforts to lead the Christian life are worthless. What I need is to be following Jesus. 
and being attached to the vine. And you know what the vine will do? He'll make sure that this branch bears fruit. All I have to do is remain in Jesus. That's it. It's as simple as that. That's why he says, I'm in the light. Follow me. Walk in the light as I am in the light. We will bear fruit, but we have to remain in the vine. I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Boy, there's the clincher, right? Apart from me. How many of you have tried to do it without <coughs> Jesus? Yeah, right? Me too. And how well did that work for you? Not well at all. Me too. And this is why. Because this is the way it works. Jesus set it up this way. That he's the vine, we're the branches. He's the true vine. We have to abide in him. Jesus is the vine which supplies the branches, us, with all the sustenance that is needed to bear much fruit. Why are we bearing fruit? For the glory of the Father. Jesus says that us bearing fruit brings glory to the Father. We've looked at the I Am statements of Jesus primarily in the Gospel of John. But the rest of the New Testament speaks volumes about the identity of Jesus. However, his fingerprints are all over the Old Testament as well. Some people say to me, well, this is fine, Foster, but this is just the New Testament. You know, we don't see Jesus in the Old Testament. Well, stand by, because you're going to see Jesus in the Old Testament. Let us make man in our image. Who is the us? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We're all involved in creation. That Spirit hovering over the waters, guess which Holy Spirit that was? The Holy Spirit, right? And we're going to come to find out that Jesus was very involved in creation. That's coming up. And we, certainly we know God the Father spoke and there was light. Spoke and things happened, right? Let us make man in our image. Jesus was involved in the Old Testament. The manna used for feeding the Israelites in the desert is a type of Jesus as the bread of life. We already talked about that. The rock that they carried in the desert. Do you remember they carried this rock? And Moses was told to speak to the rock. He said, speak to the rock, and the rock will give forth water. It's a desert, people. How do you suppose you're going to have, what, a million people roaming around in the desert with no water? There was food, manna, and there was a rock that they carried. And one day, Moses got angry with the people. And what did he do to the rock? He whacked it. He struck the rock, right? Well, the problem with that is the rock was a type of Jesus as the living water. And what was Moses' punishment? Does anybody remember what his punishment was? He didn't, he didn't get to the promised land. God took him up on a mountain and showed it to him. And he said, this is where they're going to go. I want you to see it. But you're not going to go there. Because you struck my son. And there was a penalty to repay for that. The emblem of the snake that they raised up in the desert. Remember, they raised up. God told Moses to raise up an image of a snake so the snakes would stop biting everybody. It's a type of Jesus being lifted up on the cross. Isaiah 53. If you ever want to see Jesus and you want to under, try to understand what he went through on the cross, Isaiah 53 is your chapter because it's all about him. And you say, okay, well, so that's, a, that's something about him dying on the cross. What's so big about that? Because it was written 700 years before he was born. Now you tell me that this isn't the inspired true word of God. I tell you it is right there. Because that's one of the proof texts for it. Is that God knew, had a plan. He knew his son was coming. He knew what his son was going to do. He told the prophet Isaiah, and Isaiah wrote about it 700 years before Christ was even born. Micah was one of the Old Testament prophets. He announces that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. And many more could be mentioned. Jesus is the central figure of of the entire Bible. Right? I hear people say, oh, well, it's just the New Testament. No, it's not. You better go back and read the Old Testament because you know what? When you go to the Old Testament, I dare you to go through the Old Testament and look for Jesus. He's all over the place. His fingerprints are all over it. And remember I told you earlier that Jesus was involved in creation. This is a text that I 
is this this is probably one of my favorite texts in the entire Bible. Um, I love this because it just brings closure to the idea of who Jesus is, the supremacy of the Son of God. This is in uh, Colossians uh, 1, verses uh, 15 through 20. I forgot to put it up there. But it says, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created, what? Through him and for him. Why are you here? For him. Why is anything else here? For him. He created all things. Jesus was there at creation. That is the us. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. That text alone should help you to understand who is this Jesus that we're talking about. He's the center of everything. And I don't care how far you stretch out on the circle, you have to come back to the fact that Jesus is the center of it. And this is the Jesus that we need to recognize. This is the Jesus that we worship. This is the Jesus that we follow. When we say he's worthy, he is indeed worthy. It's that Jesus. The whole Bible is about Jesus. Whether we speak about the pearl of great price, the found coin, the treasure in the field, it all refers to Jesus. In Luke 10, 38-42, we come to the very heart of the matter. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened up her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the <coughs> Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Seems like a reasonable request, doesn't it? But then we look for Jesus' answer, and he says, Martha, Martha. The Lord answered, you're worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, <coughs> or indeed, only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. And I ask you, what is it that Mary chose? No. To sit at the feet of Jesus. That Jesus. That's what we need to do. That's why it's the very heart of the matter. Jesus himself is the one and only person we need. When you have him in your life, it is complete. I want to read you one last thing. Um, every now and then, you know, there's been so many in the, in the church over the years that have that have meant so much, so many founding fathers and certainly other writers and other people, but one of the ones that means a great deal to me is uh, <coughs> Charles Spurgeon. And I'm sure you've probably heard of him at one time. He was a, a famous pastor in London, and he was very prolific. He wrote a lot of books and a lot of devotionals and whatnot. And um, I always pray when I'm working on a, on a sermon uh, that... It's what God wants me to, to say. Because I'm not here to tell you what I think. What I think doesn't matter. But I am here to tell you what God thinks. And that always matters. But this comes from a devotional that Charles Spurgeon wrote called Morning and Evening. And uh, this was today's uh, thing. And I'm not going to read all of it. But I just wanted you to read this. And it, it showed me that the Lord indeed had given me this message. It says, But the Holy Spirit turns our eyes entirely away from self. 
He tells us that we are nothing, but that Christ is all in all. Remember, therefore, it is not thy hold of Christ that saves thee, it is Christ. It is not thy joy in Christ that saves thee, it is Christ. It is not even faith in Christ, though that be the instrument, it is Christ's <laughs> blood and merits. Therefore, look not so much to thy hand with which, excuse me, thou art grasping Christ as to Christ. Look not to thy hope, but to Jesus, the source of thy hope. Look not to thy faith, but to Jesus, the author and finisher of thy faith. We shall never find happiness by looking at our prayers, our doings, or our feelings. It is what Jesus is, not what we are, that gives rest to the soul. If we, if we would at once overcome Satan and have peace with God, it must be by looking unto Jesus. Keep thine eyes simply on him. Let his death, his sufferings, his merits, his glories, his intercession be fresh upon thy mind. When thou wakest in the morning, look to him. When thou liest down at night, look to him. Oh, let not thy hopes or fears come between thee and Jesus. Follow hard after him, and he will never fail thee. I thought those were pretty profound words coming from the Prince of Preachers. So if you'll uh, bow your head with me, I'll have a word of prayer, and then I'll ask Brother Gene to come up. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to thank you for this time that we could all share together, Father. And I pray more than anything that you moved me out of the way and that, and that your word came through, Father. It's all about you, and it's all about your Son, Father. And I just pray that we would look to him for our answers that every moment of every day, that he would become bigger and bigger in our horizon. Lord, we just love you, we praise you, we thank you, we give you the glory and the honor for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.